G'day. Here's the classic wrap a rope around the earth puzzle. You may have seen it before, and it goes as follows. Here's the earth. Here's a randomly chosen country on the earth. And here's the earth's equator. What we're going to do is take a very long rope and wrap it around the earth along the equator. It's going to be a very, very long rope again, indeed. Go all the way around the front, all the way around the back. Grand and good. Now we're going to make that rope even longer. We're going to add 10 feet of length to that rope and then rewrap it around the equator. Now, slightly longer means it's going to be a little bit looser around here, so I have a little bit of space now. So I'm going to assume this is like a magic rope that can just hover above the ground uniformly all the way around. So there's a little bit of extra space, and I'll get that rope rewrapped around the equator. But the question is, I want to know how big is that little space? What's that little gap there? Can we actually find the size of that gap? Adding 10 feet of rope to the equator of the Earth produces a tiny bit, little bit of a gap. What is that gap size? Okay, so let's see if we can figure that out. Um, well, the first thing to note, this is not really a three-dimensional problem. It's actually a two-dimensional problem. What we've got here is the circle for the equator of the Earth. I'm assuming the Earth is perfectly spherical. And we've got some circumference there, what that equator is, the circumference of the equator is. Um, and then we're adding 10 feet of rope and making a concentric circle. So what we've really got here is some circumference C and circumference again plus an extra 10 feet. And our question is, can we figure out that gap size, a uniform gap size all the way around. So it's really a two-dimensional problem about concentric circles. Can we figure out that gap size G, given what's on the board right now? And it looks like the answer is probably no, we can't figure out what G is, there's not enough information. I mean, surely we at least need to know the rays of the Earth. Surely we need to know what the rays of the Earth is, I'll draw it as R here. Don't we need to know that? Maybe we do. But we can look it up. But before I go ahead and look it up, let me just, just play with what we've got. Because I've got one circumference C, and I know a form of the circumference of a circle, it's 2 pi r, so I know that the smaller circle has a circumference 2 pi r, and the outer circle also has circumference 2 pi, its radius. All right, so the circumference of the outer circle, C plus 10, is 2 pi times its radius. And I can see what its radius is, it's going to be r plus g, r plus g, 2 pi r plus g. All right, so I can at least play with that. Um, what can I do with it? Well, I know what C is, it's 2 pi r. So 2 pi r plus 10 is 2 pi r plus g. I might as well expand that out. 2 pi r plus 2 pi g. And I look at that, and then something magical happens. Subtract 2 pi r from both sides. Go away, go away. And we're left with 10 equals 2 pi g. There's an equation involving just g, which tells me g must be, what, 10 over 2 pi, which is 5 over pi. Whoa, we've actually got a number for it. But if you get out of the calculator, it's about 1.6 feet. And 1.6 feet, I believe, is about 19 inches. Yes, we got an actual number for G. It's 19 inches. We didn't actually need to know the rays of the Earth to work it out. There's the number. There's the answer. And I find this surprising in three ways. Number one, we didn't actually need to know the rays of the Earth. Didn't have to look it up because the rays of the Earth, the part of that formula is cancelled away. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Which means two, this answer is the same for all planets. It doesn't matter what the radius is, you'll get the same answer. Do this for Earth, we got 19 inches. Do this for Mars with a different radius, radius doesn't matter, you'll get 19 inches. Do it for a huge planet like Jupiter, you'll get 19 inches. Do this for a tiny planet with a radius the size of a pea or something, you'll get a gap size of 19 inches. It's always 19 inches. And the third surprise about this is 19 inches? That's huge, that's about this much. I could crawl under that. Adding just 10 feet to the entire equator of the Earth. I mean, I'm six feet tall, so, so one and two thirds of me. That's not much rope. Add that to the equator of the Earth, you get a gap you could wiggle under. That is truly astounding. Who says planets have to be round? Imagine a cubical planet. Let's take a rope and wrap it around its equator. So there's going to be a great big square for its equator. Let's go all the way around. And now again, let's add 10 feet to that length and rewrap the rope. In which case, the rope will just hover a little bit above the ground, something like this, all the way around and back out this way. Now the question is, what's that gap size? I'll call that gap size G, though my pen's a bit too thick to show G properly. All right, can we work out the gap size there? Well, again, this is really just a two-dimensional problem. I've got a square, an inner square, 
and an outer square. So two concentric squares, there they are. And I'm wondering about this gap size here. Now I know the gap size is a little bit strange on the corners there, but I'm gonna assume it's a square on the outside. I just mean the gap size on these, these parallel parts. What is the gap size? Do I need to know the radius of that square? I'm guessing now I don't. So let's see if we can figure things out here. All right, so I added 10 feet of rope. So I know the perimeter of the outer square is 10 feet longer than the perimeter of the inner square. And in fact, if I think about this for a while, I'm say, okay, let me draw the gap size G there and there. And there and there, there's a G, there's a G. There's a G, there's a G. There's a G and a G. So I'm making all these perpendicular sides right here. Because if I do that, I can see this length matches that length, this length matches that length, this matches that, this matches that. All the new rope is here and here and here and here. All 10 feet of new rope is at these corners here. A length G of it there, length G of it there, length G, length G, length G, length G, length G, length G. I can see that eight Gs add up to 10 feet. So G must be 10 over eight, which is five over four, which is 1.25 feet, which is about, oh, which is 15 inches. One and a quarter feet is 15 inches. So wrap a rope around a square planet. The gap size is a little bit smaller. It's now 15 inches. And again, it doesn't matter about the size of the planet. The answer's always 15 inches. Okay, something's going on. All right, let's try another example. A planet with an equilateral triangle for its equator. And look, here's one. Okay, so let's wrap a rope around that equilateral triangle equator. There's a rope around it. Let's add 10 feet. And we're gonna rope that just hovers above the ground, wrapping like so. And the question is, what's the gap size right there? Okay, again, it's a two-dimensional problem. So here's an equilateral triangle for the equator. And then we add 10 feet to that, you get a slightly bigger equilateral triangle with some gap size uh, we need to figure out. Uh, the key is actually again to put the gap sizes like, mark them right at the corner, G and G, two Gs right there. And right at the corners at 90 degrees, G and G. And right at the corners at 90 degrees, G and G. Because all the excess rope, all that extra 10 feet, sits at these six positions right here. All right, so our challenge is, in this two-dimensional problem, is to work out that length there, because I think I've got six copies of that length in that picture. All right, so uh, let me give myself a bit more space. Let me just uh, erase this. And uh, let me focus on one of these corners of this equilateral triangle right there. So I'll have a, a great big uh, something there, but definitely a great big equilateral triangle there. So I know that's 60 degrees for sure. I have a G at 90 degrees there, 90 degrees there, uh, length G, and a G at 90 degrees and 90 degrees there. All right, and I want to work out the lengths here. And I suspect they're going to be the same, those two. But let me just actually really clinch that and prove that. Um, my instinct is to draw a line that connects these two vertices. I suspect that line split this 60 degrees into 30 and 30 and therefore splits that angle as well, but let me, let me see if I can uh, verify that. Um, okay, I guess I've got these parallel lines here because they're on sides of rectangles. So I know whatever this angle is, it matches that angle by what? Corresponding angles and parallel lines. And ditto over here, this angle, whatever it is, matches that angle right there. Uh, what else is going on? Oh, okay, I see two right triangles here, uh, both of a side length of G, both have a common hypotenuse, I'll call it H. Oh, in which case, by Pythagoras' theorem, this length here is square root of H squared minus G squared, and this length here is also the square root of H squared minus G squared, so yes, these two lengths are indeed the same. And by side, 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 these two uh, triangles are congruent, in which case all angles match. So if that's a single dot on the right, it's also a single dot on the left. If it's a single dot on the right, it's also a single dot on the left then. In which case, oh, the 60 degrees is split into two equal parts, 30 degrees and 30 degrees. So that's 30 degrees there and 30 degrees there. So this angle at the top matches the angle at the corner of the original polygon, the equilateral triangle. Uh, what else is going on? All right, so I see, okay, all right, so I want this length here, and I've got 90 degrees and a G and a hypotenuse there. I want that length right there. 
and I know that's 30, so I'm just copying this right half here. But I can see if that's 30 degrees, this is half of a really nice triangle, half of an equilateral triangle. 60 degrees at top, 60 degrees right there, equilateral. In which case, ah, the other half is over here, all that's 2G, which means all that is 2G. The hypotenuse is actually twice G. In which case, the Pythagorean theorem now tells me, uh, whew, this thing here is 2G squared, 4G squared, take away G squared, uh, square root of, that must be root 3G. Okay, so we just proved that's root 3G, and we proved that that length is the same as that length. This is another root 3G. All the same work down here, root 3G, root 3G, root 3G, root 3G, and all those shaded bits are actually the excess length of rope, which is 10 feet. So we've just finally proved, he goes, that uh, the 10 feet of rope is six copies of uh, root 3G, in which case G is uh, 10 over 6 root 3, which is 5 over 3 root 3 feet. There it is. Okay, so the gap size for equilateral uh, for planets with equilateral triangles for the equators is five over root three, uh, five over three root three feet. Okay, here's my big question or exploration or issue for today. Let's call two planets string equivalent if wrapping ropes 10 feet longer than equators around their equators give the same gap sizes. For example, we've already seen today that wrapping a rope around a circular equator, no matter the size of that equator, is sure to give the same gap size of 5 over pi feet. Any two planets with circular, gap, uh, circular equators are sure to be string equivalent. We also saw that any two cubical planets, no matter their size, are sure to be string equivalent. Their gap size is 5 over 4 feet. And we just saw moments ago that wrapping rope around the equators of uh, planets with equilateral triangular equators, no matter their size, are sure to give the same gap size of 5 over 3 root 3 feet. They are string equivalent. So that's my big exploration question. What makes two planets string equivalent? And just to make my life a little bit easier, we'll assume our equators are convex shapes. And to make my life a little bit easier still, I'll assume they're convex polygonal shapes. I'll just work with polygons for right now. So we'll leave the idea of concave shapes and shapes with curved edges for another day. That's a good research project. All right, so what makes two planets string equivalent? Please allow me to go on a little aside for just a moment. Suppose you've got a circle, and I know its area is A and its perimeter is P. Though I guess most people call perimeter circumference in this case and probably use the letter C for it. No big deal. Alright, and I also know from my school days there are two natural formulas to associate with these quantities. Namely, P is 2 pi r and area is pi r squared. But let me be really naive about that. If all I know about is the area and the perimeter, the A value and the P value, it looks like to me you've just introduced two new uh, unknown quantities, a pi value and an R value, which is kind of weird. All right, so I say, but also you've actually given me two equations in those two unknowns. So actually I could solve for pi, whatever it is, and I could solve for R, whatever it is, from those two equations. So let me do that. Um, a clever way to do that is actually double A first. 2A would be what? 2 times pi times R squared. 2 times pi times R times R. Doing that reveals the quantity P. So twice A is our PR. So R is twice A over P. What this R thing is, I know it's twice the area of the circle divided by its perimeter. Uh, now I can probably use the first equation to solve for pi. Pi would be what? Uh, P over 2R double R, just wait till what R is. So this is actually P over double this, uh, 4A over P. Let's multiply the top and bottom each by P. So pi must be P squared over 4A. Whatever this pi thing is, I know it's the perimeter of the circle squared divided by four times its area. Great. These are the actual values that make these two equations here true. Grand and good. If I set pi to be, uh, where is it, p squared over 4a and r to be twice a over p, that's exactly what I need to make those equations work. Grand and good. But here's the thing. There's nothing special about a circle there. 
Give me any shape whose area A I know and whose perimeter P I know and define its pi value to be this and its R value to be that. And then I know these are exactly the right equations to make that, those formulas work for that shape. I mean, let me be very explicit about that. So give me a crazy shape. Uh, here's a crazy shape. I'm going to draw one. If any of us in space, boop, 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 some circular bits. Great. As long as I know its area, as long as I know its perimeter, I could set, oh, this is in a brighter color, I could set its pi value to be uh, its perimeter squared divided by 4a, and its r value, whatever that means, no idea what it means, to be twice its area over p. As soon as I set these two quantities to be those values, then I know right away the formula perimeter is 2 pi r, areas pi r squared are sure to be true for that crazy shape. So, so I'm saying right now for any shape in the plane whose area and perimeter is known, it's very natural to associate that pi value for that shape and that r value for the shape because that's what makes those formulas true for that shape. Crazy. Okay, an honesty moment. Uh, we can associate an R value with any old shape we like, that's fine, but I personally have no idea what this R value means geometrically for a shape that's as wild and crazy as that one. But there is one class of polygons for which I do know what the R value actually means geometrically. It's this class. So um, I'm talking about polygons that circumscribe a circle. So here's a circle, and imagine a polygon, uh, each of your sides just touches that circle. So I've drawn a five-sided shape with each side just touching that circle. Uh, I'm going to assume its area is A and its perimeter is P. In fact, actually, let me, let me uh, label the side lengths. A, length A, length B, length C, length D, length E. So the perimeter is actually, in this case, A plus B plus C plus D plus E. Have no five sides. Any number of sides will be fine, but what I'm about to do. Um, I'm going to see if I can make sense of what this R value is for that shape. Now, you probably guess it's the radius of that circle, but let's be really clear on that. Is it really the radius of that circle? Okay, here goes. So um, let me give that radius a name. Uh, here's the center of the circle. Let's call it S. I won't presume it's R right now. Uh, there's the S again. There's S again. There's S again. And there's S again. I've got all these radii meeting tangent lines from geometry class. I know they're 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and 90 degrees. Um, great. So I've got P, but I need to know the area. Here's the lovely thing about working at areas of these shapes. Um, let me chop into triangles like this. Let me draw these spokes from the center of the circles to the corner of the polygon, because now I can see the area of the shape is the sum of these areas of these triangles. There's one triangle, another triangle with base B, another triangle with base C, another triangle with base D, and base E. So I can say the area is actually going to be uh, the area of this triangle, half its base times height. Height happens to be S. Half A times S plus half B times S half B times S, plus half turn my head around C times S, half C times S, plus half turn my head really around, a half D times S, plus half E times S, E times S, okay, that's half of A plus B plus C plus D plus E times S, half the perimeter times S. So the area is actually half the perimeter times S, which means the R value then is what? This mysterious R value would be twice this area, P, S, divided by perimeter P is S. Yes, the R value of a polygon that circumscribes a circle of some radius is actually the radius of that circle. There it is, R equals S. That's good to know, and we'll probably use that in what comes up. Let me go back to wrapping string around equators. So for example, here's the equation of a planet. Let's assume it's always a convex polygon just to make my life easy for the moment. And what do we actually do to wrap a string to get a uniform gap size around this planet? Well, one way you can think about it is actually to construct rectangles of some gap size on each side of the, uh, the equator. So let me uh, construct a rectangle like this of some gap size g, and on this side also construct a rectangle of some gap size same g there. Do it for this side, 90, 90, g, g. Do it for this side, 90, 90, and g, g. 
and this side 90, 90, and gap size G, G, wherever the gap size is going to be. And then to get the full outer polygon, the full uh, polygon made by the stream to get those sharp corners, we should say, let's just extend these uh, parallel sides, the tops of the rectangles and the bottoms of the rectangles, uh, out a bit, and you can see actually that forms the sharp corners we need for what's going on. And that shows me how to get that outer polygon, what the wrapped string is gonna look like. It's gonna be this outer polygon here. There it is. All right, whoops, a little bit wonky there. No worries. So there's the outer polygon for a gap size G. In fact, I can see all the excess string. Uh, they're the same length, so the excess string is actually here, and here, and here, and here, and here. All right, so there's where all the excess string is uh, to go with a gap size of G. Grand and good. Now, if you look at this, you say, well, actually, all the uh, uh, mathematics of interest here is happening in these little corner bits. Let me just sort of shade them with little dots. If I look at the, all these corner bits in total, uh, I can see all the excess string is amongst those corner bits. And each, each corner bit has information about G. It's with this G everywhere. So those corner bits give me all the information I want, the gap size to go with the excess string I'm dealing with. All right. And I look at those corner bit bits and I think, well, hmm, if I'm really just ignoring the rest of this picture and I just focus on those corner bits, could I like just like bring them together? Do they actually fit together? I mean, do all these angles here add up to one uh, full turn? Do they add up to 360 degrees? Can I fit them together to make a full, full turn? And I think the answer is yes. So I look at this angle here, and this angle here, and this angle here, and this angle here, and this angle here, they're probably all different. I can actually argue they do add up to 360 degrees. But I'll do it as follows, my marker. I'll start with my marker here. It's pointing out to the left. Let me apply that amount of turning to it, zoom. Now let me slide this marker along the side, keeping it at 90 degrees. I'm not actually changing the direction of the marker, but I'm gonna add that amount of turning to it that will now change the direction of the marker, zoom. Now I've added that amount of turning plus that amount of turning to the marker, slide along here, keeping it 90 degrees to the side, add this third amount of turning, zoom. Add this fourth amount of turning, zoom. Add this fifth amount of turning, zoom. Bring it back to start for comparison, it's back pointing the same way. But I can see the marker underwent one full turn of turning. All the turning happened here, 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 and here. These five angles must add up to 360 degrees. Which means I can associate with this convex polygon, this original equator, a very basic polygon, which is just bring these pieces together. So I'm gonna do it over here, I'll bring these pieces together. So this has a side that looks like it's out there at length G, and a side length out there of length G. Uh, this one has the same side length there, but another one down here of length G. Uh, I've got that side length there, there's the same side length there, but now I've got one that's like straight down at G. There's the one that's straight down at G, and I've got one that's sort of basically this way at length G, and I'm back to that one, which is the same as that. Great. So I could say there's a circle of radius G right there, and this is uh, 90 degrees. Yes, this line is tangent to, uh, this line here is tangent to that uh, radius there. So I've actually got a tangent here and a tangent here. I guess that makes that little corner right, oh, I guess I'm up here right now. Still 90 degrees and 90 degrees, I guess it's making that piece. 90 degrees and 90 degrees is making uh, this piece. And all the way around, in fact, I'm really just drawing the tangent lines right there. These five pieces do indeed fit together to make a lovely polygon with a full 360 degrees there. In fact, it's a polygon that's, that uh, circumscribes a circle of radius G. All right, so this is the, I'll call this the natural uh, basic polygon to go with my equator. Every equator will have a natural basic polygon to go with it. Namely, it's gonna be where all these corners fit together to make that nice shape there. All right, all right. Now, this natural basic polygon has all the information I'm interested in because its perimeter would be this and this and this and this and this. The perimeter here is a uh, oh, right, perimeter. Perimeter is the excess string. Now, in all my examples, it's been 10 feet so far, but it can be anything you want. I'll just call it delta P, change in P, change in perimeter. And its radius. Radius, so that's very bad, very smudgy. The perimeter is the excess string. So that's the perimeter, perimeter here, and the radius 
is actually g, the gap size. Yep, I care about excess string in this puzzle, I care about gap size in this puzzle, and there they both are. All right, so let me play with the natural basic polygon that goes with any equator. Because I know with any polygon, I can associate with it a natural pi value and a natural r value. Remember doing that? All right, so I'm associating with that a natural pi value. So associate a pi value. Associate with this, associate a pi value. All right, so this polygon has a pi value. It's, what is it? Uh, P squared over 4a, what that is. It also has a natural r value, but we just proved a moment ago that natural r value is g. Oh, it's a polygon that, that circumscribes a circle of radius g. The natural r value is g. All right, so that means right now I know the area of this polygon is that pi value g squared, and the perimeter of this polygon, delta p, is our 2 pi r, 2 pi g. Grand and good. Do you know what? I actually like the second formula best of all. Because that tells me the gap size is guaranteed to be the amount of excess string you have divided by 2 pi, the natural pi value of that polygon. Which is amazing. Because if I said delta p was 10, like all my previous examples, this equals 5 over the pi value, the pi value of this polygon. Whoa, because we were getting that in our answers. When I was wrapping string around a circle, the gap size was 5 over pi. When I was wrapping strings around a square, the gap size was 5 over 4, and 4 is the pi value of a square. When I was wrapping strings around an equilateral triangle, I was getting 5 over 3 root 3. 3 root 3 is the pi value of an equilateral triangle. This is all hanging together. Whoa! So there is a formula for our gap size. Given a certain amount of excess string, there's the gap size. What's also nice about this formula, it shows me that gap size and excess string are in a proportional relationship. If you double the amount of excess string, you'll double the gap size. If you increase the amount of excess string by a factor of 10, your gap size will increase by a factor of 10, you'll make it 10 times as big. This is lovely. This explains what's going on with the excess string and the gap size for any convex polygonal shaped equator of all. Just work out its pi value and that's what the gap size is gonna be. This is amazing. All right, let me summarize where we are right now. We're looking at planets with very strange equators. And for simplicity, we assume that equators are always in the shape of a convex polygon of some kind. And what we're doing is wrapping rope around those equators of some excess length to the length of the equator. We've always been adding 10 feet to our ropes in all the puzzles so far, an excess of 10 feet. It can be any excess length we like. Grand and good. And we're interested in the size, the gap between the, uh, uh, the, the longer rope around the equator and the surface, the actual equator length. All right, this is really a two-dimensional problem, not a three-dimensional problem. So here's the convex polygon representing the equator, and we're wrapping a rope around that convex polygon of an extra length, uh, 10 feet or delta p. I've been calling the excess length delta p up to now. And we're interested in the gap size between these two polygons. So I've got an outer polygon and the original inner polygon with some gap size g. In fact, if I draw the gap sizes in all these little corners, g and g's and more, lots of g's all over here, it's like I'm really constructing rectangles on the side of the original polygon, all of side length g. All right, grand and good. Fine. But we looked at this and said, well, actually, all the key information is in these pieces over here. These little wedge shapes at the corners of the original polygon have all the excess uh, string, excess rope that we're interested in. So there's my excess 10 feet of rope if delta p is 10. And all these pieces contain the length g. So those corner pieces have the excess length and g, everything you want to know about them. And then we notice that all these pieces actually have a full 360 degrees at these angles of the corner actually fit together to make a nice polygon in their own right. Here's a length G, here's a length G, here's a length G, and here's a length G. I'm actually going to make a little circle of radius G, and actually these pieces are coming from all these little tangent line segments like this. Uh, like that, and all the way across like this. There we go, a little bit wonky, but that's the idea. In fact, this piece here is right there, this piece is there, this piece is here, this piece is here, and this perimeter is our excess length. 
grand and good. All right, and then we saw that actually associated to this polygon are two natural values, a pi value and an r value. Well, the r value turns out to be g, because this is a polygon that circumscribes a circle of radius g. So its r value is g. So we're going to look at just, say, the pi value, the natural pi value. So every planet equator has a natural pi value associated with it. In fact, I looked at what I call the natural uh, basic polygon that goes with this equator, and the pi value we associate with the equator is the pi value of the natural basic polygon of that equator. And finally, we got to the point that we now have a form for this gap size g. g is the excess length divided by 2 pi, the associated pi value. Grand and good, that's where we are. But except we're also playing with the idea of string equivalence. I'm going to say two different planets are string equivalent if they produce the same gap size whenever you wrap ropes around them of the same excess length around the equators. If we were doing, always doing 10 feet, we want to got the same gap size. So two planets are, are string equivalent if they produce the same gap size if I use the same excess amount of length. But I guess we've now actually established a theorem. Oh, if I'm using the same delta p for the two planets and I want the same g, it must be that I have the same pi values. Or if I have the same pi values associated with the natural polygons, then I'm guaranteed to get the same gap sizes. So I guess we have a theorem. We have a theorem. This notion of being string equivalent, two planets are string equivalent if and only if uh, associated pi values are the same. Whoa, that completely characterizes string equivalence. Two palette planets are string equivalent if you get the same pi value over here. All right, okay, so we're doing something here. Um, actually, I can go a little bit further. Let me clean the board and go a bit more with this notion of string equivalence. Back in a moment. Here's a five-sided polygon with angles alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. I'm going to assume these two sides are parallel because what I want to do to this polygon is stretch it out and make it a longer version of the same of itself. So here's a longer version of the same polygon with the same angles alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. So the same angles in the same order. I'm going to call those two polygons angle equivalent. I can find a way to march around each polygon so the angles I encounter and turn match precisely. Great, they're angle equivalent. Now I'm going to imagine this is the equator of one planet, and this is the equator of a second planet. I'll choose some excess length, delta p, maybe 10 feet, and wrap a rope 10 feet longer than this perimeter around that shape. Okay, so this is 10 feet longer, say, some fixed delta p, and I will definitely get some gap size g as a result. Do the same thing here, the same excess length, delta p, 10 feet, say. All right, wrap a rope around that, and I'll get some gap size, but I'm not convinced it's going to be the same gap size. I'll just call it H over there. All right, OK. So let's analyze what's the gap size for each of these two planets. Well, I do that by looking at these regions. These are all the key regions, these little corner parts. So let me just draw those in. My picture's not very good, forgive me. But this is G and G and G and G and G and G, all these rectangles, all these Gs. And I like these little wedge pieces here. Over here, I'll get the same thing, an H, an H, and an H, an H, and an H, 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 rectangle, rectangle, H, H, rectangle, rectangle, H, H. Great. So now I've got all these excess pieces here, which is what I'm interested in to make my natural basic polygon for that one, and all the pieces here to make the natural basic polygon for this equator. All right, but before I do that, let me notice something. Um, we did prove that this outer polygon is angular equivalent to the inner polygon. If that's angle beta in there, that's also angle beta out there. I know that's 90 degrees and 90 degrees, therefore I know that this angle here is 90 minus beta. Exactly the same reasoning. That's beta out here, 90, 90, that's also 90 minus beta. So I've just discovered that this angle here has the same measure as that angle there. In fact, all the way around, that angle is going to be the same as that angle, by the same argument. This angle here is going to have the same measure as that angle. This angle is going to have the same measure as this angle, and this angle is going to have the same measure as that angle. All right, so that means when I form my natural basic polygon with this, I'm going to be using pieces with the same angles, but radius g. All right, so pieces with the same angles. So here's a radius g, looks like I've got this one going up. So I have this one going right with the same angle there. This one going down 
with that angle there, uh, this one going sideways with that angle there, and this one going up this way with that angle there. There's my circle of radius G, and here's my natural basic polygon to go with it. All right. And I know that that perimeter there all is all my excess string, which I was thinking of 10. Over here, I'm doing the same thing. I'll do exactly the same angles, uh, but now my radius is H, a new gap size potentially, exactly the same work. It's just I'm now using a length of H. So I get a different size circle. I'll make its natural basic polygon to go with that. But I do know its perimeter is the excess string length. It's the same. 10 and 10. Whoa! I also have that this angle is the same as that angle. I have that this angle is the same as that angle. This angle is the same as that angle. All these angles match. I bet you could prove these two shapes that uh, enclose a circle have to be similar. So one's a scale factor copy of the other. Okay. But the primitives are the same. If one's a scale factor copy of the other, then the primitive goes up by factor K. But the primitive hasn't changed. That K must be 1. These two are figures right here must actually be congruent. And if they're congruent, then all the lengths I see must be the same. We must have that G equals H. Whoa! Whoa! I guess I have just proved if I use the same amount of excess string around these two angle equivalent polygons, then I'm sure to have the same gap size. We have just proven that if two polygons are angle equivalent, that is if two planets have equators that are angle equivalent, then they're going to be string equivalent planets. Angle equivalent implies string equivalent. Whoa! If two planets have equators that are angle equivalent, then those planets are guaranteed to be string equivalent. They'll give you the same gap size if you use the same excess amount of string. Um, I also say as a corollary that, uh, well, uh, if two polygons are angle equivalent, that's fine, they have matching angles. Oh, if two polygons are similar, they certainly have matching angles, they're angle equivalent. So I can also say similar polygons. If I have two polygons that are similar, then they're guaranteed to give me planets that are string equivalent as a consequence of that, because they're similar, all angles match, therefore they're angle equivalent, therefore they're string equivalent. Wow, wow, wow. Now the question is, does this work backwards? Does string equivalent imply similar? Does string equivalent imply angle equivalent? Hmm. Last section we showed that two planets have angular equivalent equators, then they're sure to be string equivalent. Angular equivalents imply string equivalents. Turns out the converse is not true. String equivalence does not imply angular equivalence. It way doesn't imply angular equivalence. Because I can construct a crazy example like this. It's actually possible to create a planet with a triangular equator and a second planet with a quadrilateral equator so that those two planets are actually string equivalent. There's no way those two equators are similar. There's no two way those, those equators are angle equivalent. They're totally different numbers of size. The number of size doesn't even have to be the same to be string equivalent. So let me show you how it's possible to construct an example like that. But to do so, let me you know, give one little result about polygons that circumscribe circles. They seem to be like coming up over and over again in our thinking here. So imagine I start with a planet whose polygon was indeed, uh, who, sorry, whose equator really was a polygon that circumscribes a circle of some radius. Who knows what radius is going to be? Some radius. If I use that as the equator of my planet, then what I do is wrap a string around that of some excess length, maybe 10 feet. So I'll get an outer polygon like this. And then to work out its gap size, I would need, okay, the amount of excess length divided by twice the pi, pi being the associated, be the pi value of the associated natural polygon. Okay, let's create, create the natural basic polygon of this. So I'll get some gap size G, uh, gap size G, gap size G, and gap size G, gap size G. There we go. So I'm going to take all these pieces. I know they fit together to make one full term. I'll create a polygon um, with, uh, that circumscribes a circle of radius G. And I'll get a G. I'll get a G like this. I'll get a G like that. It's a bit too long, James. Uh, G there and a G that goes up this way. And I can see I'll get a circle of radius G. And its natural associated polygon is something like this. Great. 
great, great, great. And uh, that's the pi value. I'm going to associate with that, work out the pi value of that thing. And then I know the gap size is going to be x is length twice that pi value. All right. Now what's curious here, I've got here, uh, what color can I do? Maybe, we'll do it. Maybe this red will show. I've got here my original equator, which is a polygon that circumscribes the circle. And the natural polygon I associate with that is another one that circumscribes the circle. In fact, in fact, I do know that this angle here matches that angle there. The outer polygon turns it to be angular equivalent to the inner polygon. So I know right now that this angle here matches that angle there. By the same token, these angles, oops, sorry, these angles match, and these angles match, and these angles match, and those angles match. The angles in this polygon match the angles of my original polygon. Moreover, I bet you could play with similar triangles. Play with similar triangles if I keep drawing on all these radii. Remember, we actually showed that these are um, uh, angle, bi uh, angle bisectors. I bet you can prove this triangle similar to this triangle. And then in the end, by chopping up all these little triangles, I bet you can prove that this figure is similar to that figure. That these are actually similar. These are similar shapes. Okay, all right, some details to figure out there, but some details, just details. All right, so that means the natural basic polygon associated with my uh, planet's equator is similar to the planet's equator. All right, they're basically the same shape. Now, if you're doing all the exercises in this video, you may have proved at one point that uh, similar shapes have the same pi value. Oh, so the pi value I'm creating here is actually the same as the pi value of the original shape. This has the same pi value. All right, so if I'm playing with planets whose equators are uh, polygons that circumscribe a circle, I can just work with the pi values directly of those shapes. All right, because I know if I work with those pi values, I'm really working with those pi values, which really gives me what the gap's going to be. Grand and good. All right, all right, okay, that's setting up for me how to create examples like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a triangular shape that circumscribes a circle and a quadrilateral shape that circumscribes a circle that have the same pi values. So if, this, if they have the same pi values, then I know if I use the same excess string, I'll get the same gap size, in which case they are string equivalent planets. All right, so I have a circle that circumscribes a circle, uh, sorry, a triangle that circumscribes a circle and a quadrilateral that also circumscribes a circle. How could I get them to have the same pi value? Here goes. All right, so let me draw this. Um, need more space. I'm running out of clean paper towel to actually clean this board properly. Things are getting smudgy at the end of this long video. All right. Okay, I'll start with a circle of the simplest radius possible. I'll just do radius one. Radius one for my triangle and a circle of radius one for my quadrilateral. Um, now there's lots of triangles on Craig. So let me do a base for my triangle. And once I've got a base, I can go up and just see where these two sides have to be, and they'll meet somewhere up here. So I get a triangle with some perimeter. Here's the thing I want to note. If I use a slightly shorter base, like just make this a little bit shorter, so chop off some length there, then I get, okay, I'll certainly get a triangle, but if I brought my base in a bit shorter, I have to go up higher, way higher before they have to meet. I'll get a triangle of longer perimeter. If I make the base even shorter still, smidgen shorter still, it's going to force me to go even higher and get a perimeter that's even longer still. In fact, I could probably make this perimeter as big as I want it to be. So I'm going to draw some short base and arrange it so the perimeter is massively huge. I mean, it can vary from some like I don't know some starting value all the way up to basically something as large as I want it to be. I can get the perimeter to be any value I want beyond some beginning place. Huge perimeter if I want. I could do the same thing with quadrilaterals. Just make it a crooked base. Do a little bend like that. And then once I've got two sides, the other two sides are forced on me. And I can arrange it so that this perimeter could also be any value I like, from some beginning starting value up to something massively huge by making the shorter, shorter, shorter. I get a huge perimeter. Well, here's the thing. That gives me wiggle room now. I can actually arrange matters so that this has a perimeter, one value, and arrange it so well, this has some huge perimeter, make sure this has the same perimeter as well. I bet I could create a triangle around a circle of radius one and a quadrilateral around a circle of radius one with the same perimeter. Do that, because then you're golden. Use these as the equators of your planets. I now claim these have the same pi values, so I use the same extra string length, I'll get the same gap size. These two planets will be string equivalent. All right, why is that the case? 
All right, so, okay, so I need to show they have the same pi value. Now remember the pi value was p squared over 4a. They have the same p. What's the area for each of these? Well, I'm gonna do the same trick I've been doing before, but working out areas of polygons that circumscribe circles. Radius one, radius one, radius one. I actually work out the area by chopping this into triangles. Here's one triangle and another triangle, which goes up here, and a third triangle. The area of this triangle was half its base times one, plus half its this base times one, plus half this base times one. The area is half the whole perimeter times one, half of P. Same token, uh, one, 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 one. To work out the area here, chop into triangles, as shown there. The area of this triangle is half this base, the side length times one, plus half this base, side length times one, plus half this base, side length times one, half this base, side length times one. I've just added all the perimeter. The area here is half P times one. To have the same area, half of P. Oh, this has the pi, the pi value, P squared over uh, 4A. P is the same, A is the same. That has exactly the same pi value. These two polygons have the same pi value, Whoa! Which means then they have the same gap size for any excess amount of string. That means I have, in principle, created two planets, one with a triangular equator, one with a quadrilateral equator, that are actually string equivalent. String equivalence does not imply you need the same number of sides. Therefore, you don't need the polygons to be similar or angular equivalent or anything. They can actually be quite wild. Wow, this is kind of fun.